il, il controllo Piacere, sì, sì, sì. Sì, eh. sì no, in realtà ci siamo visti ad Alicante, però di... Ah, di, 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 di eh. no, Alicante poi è stato un delirio. Sì, sì. Ah, bene, grazie. Tutto bene? Sì, sì, sì. Stavo sì, contenta, contenta, sta venendo sì, bene. Sì, 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 sì. Bene, bene. Ora contenta. speriamo che si ripopoli come era stamattina. Sì, eh, c'è un po' di gente scappata, però va bene. Sì, no, va bene, non c'è problema. Va bene, va bene. Ora, stavo dicendo, ci siamo ancora un po' di minutini. Sì, 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 sì. Eh, e... Come funziona? Chiamo una alla volta, okay, sì, no, perché così abbiamo fatto, perché eh, tra l'altro, visto che poi registriamo, si sta bene qui, e se okay. più o meno in questa zona qua, okay. dove si, ah, vorrei un pochino, perché non c'è una volta, eh, cioè siamo un, diciamo nel, nel cono centrale, non fa neanche interferenza con... Una, Good afternoon. We are going to start I mean, this new amazing session. We had quite intensive days talking about I mean, the ocean data collection, the way we processing data, the way we making data, all the, I mean, the complete value change about the data, how to transform this in valuable product for the people. Today, we are, this afternoon, we are going to dig a bit more in the, I mean, some topics that are, of course, very related to what we are discussing uh, for uh, the past two days. Because we are discussing about uh, the relationship between the biodiversity and the sustainability. And we are going to speak about some pollutions that we may have in the sea. So we are speaking about, I mean, the acidification. We are speaking about, I mean, the uh, underwater noise. We are speaking about how this kind of uh, anthropic impact are dealing and affecting, uh, I mean, the mm, different uh, systems that are living in, in the sea. And then we are also speaking about uh, uh, some new 
things that we can think in order to mitigate or have a, a clever use of uh, some spaces that are already allocated to uh, industries or to uh, activities that are also producing, for example, energy. So a multi-use of wind farm uh, siting. So I would like to start with uh, Dina. <laughs> and uh, she's going to uh, talk about knowing, lo loving, protecting the oceans. So Dina, welcome. And th there you are. Thank you very much, Antonio. Hello, everyone. Yes, perfect. I know how it works. So I was yesterday here moderating a, a full day event. Um, we were having a big program with 26 speakers discussing all aspects of oceanography, ocean observing, modeling, skills of models and things like that. Um, we had a blast as a community. We really shared latest techniques and science. It was fantastic. For us, as an in-reach, it was great. I mean, we had, we discussed, shared information, communicated. You know, in-reach is when you communicate within your community so that you have better understanding where you are. But did we do well on outreach, you know, communicating beyond the community? And that is something we discussed yesterday as well. And we all agreed that uh, we should tell our ocean stories better, actually. We, we have so much stories in ocean science, and I look forward to the rest of the session hearing what the colleagues will be telling us, how to tell them better. Who should be telling those ocean stories? Uh, is it the scientists who have this information? Well, uh, in my world, uh, in, ocean in oceanography, in ocean observations, they are quite busy, you know, being in rough conditions, in the sea, sampling researching, uh, documenting the evidence? Should they be better journalists and photographers to communicate their stories? Or is it the, the job of journalists and photographers to communicate? Or is it the media are to blame that we don't have enough awareness about the threats that the humanity have posed to the ocean? So um, these are the questions we are asking ourselves in the organization where I work. You see the logo at the bottom, European Global Ocean Observing System. And we have uh, brought together a community of scientists and scientific institutions, oceanographic agencies, hydrographic agencies, met offices, research institutes, who are active, in addition to their science, in public awareness, in promoting their ocean stories. And we did um, a survey of how active they are. And actually, uh, this was in preparation of our action in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which is a UN uh, initiative for the 10 years between 2021 and 2030. We have a project there to really step up the societal engagement in science. We did a survey. How much societal engagement is happening in ocean research? And actually, there is a lot. There are multi-annual programs, there are children competitions, school competitions. You see some samples here, sometimes public are on board a vessel, giving, f getting fascinating uh, stories about uh, water sampling. Um, but in Eurogus, we try to leverage it and give it visibility at global level and international level. Because by just doing this alone, we already enlarge the community of practitioners and we can share knowledge and best practices much better. But is it enough? Again, you know, it's again the in-reach. So we also do something for outreach. We uh, get together as a community. We prepare training, for example, this year for scientists to be more active in uh, public engagement. Uh, we also have six recommendations in our policy brief on the topic, how to increase the ocean literacy offer in research institutes. And our main uh, message is, Ocean literacy, public engagement, speaking outside of our community is a predominant part of science. What, what we do as scientists, we should do as much as well speaking outside. It is as important. So here are six short recommendations in our policy, but if you can find it on our website. One is ocean literacy, public engagement, gives uh, science relevance to society. We speak with economic actors, we speak with policymakers, they understand science much better, and this is extremely important for getting our funding right, for getting more research being done, etc. Then 
When we do ocean literacy, when we do societal engagement, public outreach, we sometimes forget to monitor the impact of this. And this is very important. Without monitoring the impact, we don't really harness the maximum of the results. Thirdly, uh, on itself, public engagement and ocean literacy is an important research topic in science. We need to uh, look into it as a new area of activity and really dedicate uh, funding and resources to it. We need to do ocean literacy and outreach in partnerships. We are not supposed to be best photographers, journalists, or um, story makers. We need to work with professionals in other disciplines. And of course, the ocean race is an amazing opportunity to connect the different worlds together between science and, for example, sport. We need to continue collaborating among ourselves as practitioners, uh, because this will give us much more relevance and much more visibility. And finally, and importantly, we need to have ocean literacy and outreach available for everyone. People working in um, unique environments, in hospitals, in prisons, uh, accessible in all sorts of different uh, health conditions, accessible outside of the leisure time. It's very nice to take your family to see the ocean uh, maybe on the weekend, but it's something else to have it in your working environment as part of your business development strategy, for example. So we all can share our ocean stories in the different ways. And I have brought you uh, something from how I decided to share the ocean story. It's a little uh, child book that I've written. This is an Italian version. There are more there. Uh, it exists in five languages, including the English. It's a story of uh, this guy here. You see the turtle. He's an oceanographer. He's not just a turtle. He has a little tag on his back. If you open the book, you will see. So he's collecting ocean data, and he's explaining things about the ocean, why it's threatened, why it's important, how to protect it. Um, I launched it at a high-level event, you know, very pompous like this. It was an event where industry and policy comes together to uh, make commitments for ocean sustainability. But of course, it's much more popular with the children. Actually, it's popular with the adults, too. It's a conversation starter. It's something you can use as a basis to you know, uh, encourage others to share the stories. But there are also some personal stories linked to this book. First, uh, my reviewer was my daughter, who was five at the time. It was great to get her feedback, so I, I knew how to end the story, how to make it more uh, compelling for the children. And second, my scientific uh, co-editor was a PhD, important uh, scientist and oceanography research manager with a long career. He, uh, after we published the book in October, in December, he took it for Christmas for his family. He came back, he said, Dina, it's the first time my family were interested in what I'm doing. <laughs> they saw my name as co-editor in the book, in the child book, and they were like super thrilled, you know? I could explain them for the first time in 20, 30 years that he's been doing this. So I am um, looking forward to the stories we're going to hear. I think we, as a community of uh, researchers, uh, early career, uh, advanced career, we need to do better in reach, communicate among ourselves, share information, and help each other when we are struggling against the budget deadlines and uh, all sorts of different obstacles. But we also by doing this can increase the outreach much stronger. So, and I hope the best for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Very nice message, very nice presentation. And somehow you're already addressing the point. I mean, we are, we are studying ocean, but it's not just water. <laughs> it's, I mean, a very lively <laughs> ecosystem. So I would like to welcome on uh, the stage Paola Tep uh, Tepsic from uh, Chima Foundation, and she's going to tell us about uh, cetacean response to marine activities. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to these very interesting sessions. Um, yes, I will present today part of our research in understanding how cetaceans uh, are actually responding to all the human activities are present in the area. And you will see how this is actually really connected to how science has to be used to raise awareness and how the awareness has to be um, transformed in uh, sustainable behaviors. 
First of all, just a brief introduction on who we are. Chima Resolve Foundation is a non-profit uh, research uh, institute. Our headquarters is in Savona, and our funders are the Civil Protection Department, the Region of Liguria, the University of Genoa, the province of Savona, and ARPAL. While the main topic of research of Chima is actually disaster risk assessment and civil protection, it also deals now with climate change adaptations and biodiversity cons conservation. And specifically, we're looking where actually we are located and where we actually are now. We are facing one of the most interesting areas in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Ligurian Sea, and actually the square I, I highlighted is exactly the area just in front of us, um, share the same features and the same processes that ca we can find in the open oceans. So this means we are actually living just be beside the ocean, which sometimes is something that we feel very far from us, but actually just in front of us we have submarine canyons, we have sea mounts, which are actually ancient volcanoes, we have oceanographic processes that, be, that uh, bring colder water up the surface, which results in higher primary productivity. This is actually the only area in the entire Mediterranean Sea where we do have a spring phytoplankton bloom whose intensity is actually almost the same one that we have in the ocean. And what is then the result of these increasing things? Well, this is the result. This area is the home of uh, all the eight species of cetaceans that we can find in the Mediterranean Sea. There are different types of dolphins, different species of deep diving species, like the cuvus beaked whales, the sperm whales, and even the largest whale, such as the fin whales. They all inhabit this area all the year around, inhabiting different types of habitat, from the coastal water to the really open oceans. Uh, the cetaceans, well, while being obvious, obviously very engagement from a point of view of the public, are actually really important because considering their ecology, their size, their habit, uh, they are at the top of very complex trophic food webs. This means that by understanding their ecology, understanding their status of health, understanding how they comply with the presence of anthropic activities, we are directly protecting an entire food web of biodiversity, reaching also the smaller organisms from sea turtles, fishes, and even the plankton. Well, this is a very rich area indeed, we know that, but this is also one of the most used areas. The Mediterranean Sea, as its name says, it's a, land, it's a sea between the lands. It means it is, has always been used by all the humans living uh, on their coasts as one of the main uh, um, source of uh, resources for industry, fishing, tourism, and even transport. This map is showing the average intensity of traffic that we actually have in the Mediterranean Sea during the summer months, which are also the months where cetaceans and generally marine biodiversity are more actually aggregated in the area. And as you can see in the square that I lighted before, just in front of us, we do have one of the main uh, intense traffic areas due also to the big ports that we are here. Then, how are actually cetaceans, and with them all the biodiversity living with them, complying with the presence of such intense human activities? One of our main research activity is dedicated to this whale, which is one of the least whale in the world. It's the cuvus beaked whales. And it's, it's incredible to imagine that while this species is considerably very rare everywhere in the world, we here have a stable population that we have been studying for the last 20 years. So our research is aimed to understanding how is this species complying with the presence of large and noisy vessels. And why I stress uh, the fact that these vessels are noisy? Well, cuvus beaked whales are deep diving species. This means they dive uh, for almost 90 minutes at depth of over 1,000 meters, and they use sounds to find their prey and communicate to each other. So the sounds that the shipping is making in the area is probably interfering with their activities. How, do, how can we understand what do the, the whales do when they are with, uh, in the same position as the, the ships? Well, we equipped some of these animals with this uh, tag. These are two types of satellite tags that actually are small computers measuring the position and the behavior of the whale for over a long period. Uh, 
in the past summer, we have been able to equip at least eight individuals. Six of them uh, managed to, with six of them, we managed to have data for almost one month, while for two of them, the data were only two weeks. But actually, thanks to the work that we have done in the past years, we are now able to identify each single whale. Well, here you see numbers, identification numbers, but I can assure you we give them nice names like Zeus or Cleopatra to just identify them when we are out at sea. And these allow us to understand also the different behaviors connected with the sex and age classes. And what did we find out? This is a short video that uh, shows you uh, a day in the life of a curious beaked whale. The white dots are the curious beaked whale just wandering around in the central part of uh, their habitat. And all the red dots are the ships uh, whose tracks have been uh, reconstructed using the IS data, uh, showing how actually the overlap of the movement that we have for the, the whales and the, the presence of the ships is really strong. We are now in step inspecting even more this data, trying to understand which are the ships that most often approach the animals and at what speed. And surprisingly, even though we know that the main uh, source of traffic here is due to cargo and passengers, actually also private yachts seem to have a very strong impact on the species. Also because their trucks are not predictable and they go at a very high speed. We are now also, thanks to the satellite tag, trying to understand how their diving profile is changing according to the speed and how close the, the whales are at any time of their day in a ship. But this, again, it was only one day. So can you imagine how it is in one month or even their entire life? But actually, marine traffic is not only a threat to just these species. Actually, marine traffic is one of the main threats for the largest whale, especially the fin whale. The individual we see here, we have called it a propeller for obviously region because of the scars that uh, uh, identify this animal, we actually is um, a very frequent, uh, I would say not frequent flyer, but it's very frequently present uh, in our waters. We encounter this uh, whale almost every summer. And it, also, it always reminds us how ship strikes and collision with large vessels are actually affecting the conservation of the, of the fin whales in the Mediterranean Sea. And the impact of shipping the fin whales and sperm whales is, has been one of the topic of two European projects that we have developed in order to map the main areas where uh, ship strikes can occur, not only in advance, trying to forecast and understand where the species will be probably more present along the main traffic uh, corridors, but also to trace back once uh, a carcass has been uh, uh, signaled to us uh, how to backtrack and understand where the collision occurred and where the carcass is going to strand. But we need to minimize this and we need to prevent this. We need to use this information actually to change the behavior directly out at sea. So now we are involved in a European project which actually foresees the presence of marine bubble observers directly in the command deck of very large passenger ferries. And this is one case of a near miss collision. You can see uh, it's not, not that visible, but actually this ferry is really crossing the path of a whale. Uh, and mm, thanks to the presence of the marine bumble alerting also the people on the deck, the collision has been uh, uh, evitated and the whale is uh, still uh, safe. So the presence of observers is uh, directly raising the awareness of the common deck and changing their behaviors. And this is also accompanied by uh, training courses that are held uh, online uh, with some cartoons and some tests that uh, the crew can uh, follow directly where they are, when they're on board or where they are not, so that came they understand the, why their behaviors while navigating are so important. I still remember the first time I went on a command deck of a ferry leaving from Genova, hearing the captain telling to me, why are you here? I've been navigating here 30 years, and I've never seen a whale. And I just said, well, there's one there. So sometimes you just need to make them see what they were not been seeing for the past 30 years. 
But shipping is not the main threat. It's the main threat, but it's not only the main threat connected to marine traffic. The presence of whales here uh, has been the reason why uh, in touristic activities such as day whale watching has actually developed exactly along these coasts. And whale watching is known to be uh, is not how it has, it has always been seen as the, a, a good alternative to whaling. We actually have never had whaling here in the Mediterranean Sea, and whale watching is a good alternative for sure, but still it's something that has to be uh, followed and whose development must be, uh, we must make sure that its development is sustainable. You can think that during the past 15 years, the number of whale watching operators has increased at an incredible rate. And uh, this is why, together with the international agreements of Pelagos and Acobams, we are actually now delivering these high quality whale watching labels. We are the certificators for, the, for Italy to train and to raise awareness on whale watching operators that following good codes of conduct when approaching the animals is the only way that we can make sure that the animal will stay there and that will um, uh, allow them to even develop more their activities. And this is not it. I mean, there are so many things that we can learn from the animal. And actually, new technologies such as drones and biopsy samplings are allowing us to understand always more and more about all the impacts that, we, that the humans are having on these populations. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Paola, very much. And I guess that this is a perfect, uh, let's say, handover uh, towards Fabrizio because you say that, I mean, marine traffic is one of the main sources of, uh, I mean, problems at the sea. And they are the main source of underwater noise. So Fabrizio is going to tell us thank about you. what is underwater noise. So Paola, thank you again. We have thank Fabrizio you. from Remote. Hello. <coughs> Should I share my screen or yes, are you go. projecting? Yes, You can share it. We can oh, see okay, you look. <laughs> very well. We can hear you very well. And now it's also coming your presentation. So I uh, am going to, do, can you see me? No. We are Not waiting yet. for, uh, yes. Now is, we see your presentation on Fabrizio and it, it is in the presentation. Okay, now. so now I apologize from the beginning because I thought I, I'm going to give this in Italian, so I translated some slides from English into Italian, which proved to be wrong. But the next, the coming stuff I'm going to talk about, so it's, it's going to be easier for you to understand. So what is anthropogenic noise? Where are the sources? Do you see the next slide? Do you see the blue one or, or still not? No, yeah. So it takes, it takes some time to come. Good. So um, I probably quit my camera. OK, good. Antonio, you tell me if you don't see anything, OK? Yes. OK, we are on the OK, so where comes, blue. yeah, where does anthropogenic noise come from? This is a famous picture taken from a, a, a publication available uh, publicly, and it describes nicely where the main sources of noise are from. Basically, they are from three different activities. One is pile driving and seismic uh, prospections, uh, which are related to oil and gas development and uh, renewables uh, development. Then we have harbor construction, so development at the coastal zone, and shipping, shipping noise, shipping intended by uh, the noise produced by vessels for propulsion, from propulsion for propulsion purposes. Any type of vessel produces this kind of noise. On the other side, the recipients are, as you can see, dolphins, whales, fish, some invertebrates, and uh, even uh, Posidonia, even algae can sense particle motion, which, one, which is one of the two components of uh, uh, noise. For our presentation, we talk about noise. If we look at the sound, which has the potential for being for having negative impacts on marine life. So noises are a subset of sound. Next slide. 
I'm hoping this works. We are waiting for the next slide. Me too. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so the first uh, example I have for you is the sperm whale. It's yes. not yet. Yes, there it is. Uh, I am hoping that, uh, do you know, Antonio, how to share the sound? Uh, yeah, we, we, we can try. We never tried. So Fabrizio, you're uh, testing our sound. Okay. <laughs> we do it now. Yeah, we try. Try it. Okay, I need the next slide. Okay, here we are. Jonah? Yes. Does it work? Yes. No. Now we switch it to another presenter. Massimo is later. Ah, okay. So the noise. <laughs> The connection is gone. But yeah, I am okay. Now you at least yeah, again. you're coming back. <laughs> but we heard, I mean we listen to the, the noise. No. You're getting back, Fabrizio. Uh, there you are. Now we see also this uh, yeah, the spectrum. Did you hear it? Yes, we do. Fantastic. Okay, let's go on. The next one is a kind of more, a little bit more difficult. This is the fin whale, which talks in a very low frequency, so we need to speed up the sound in order for you to be able to listen to it. And it's a, I'm waiting for the slide to change on your screen. There we are. And the next one, because I'm already at the next one, which shows you how the song is composed. The song is composed by two types of pulses. The ones which are called classic are with the letter A on this, on this slide. And the ones which are called backbeats are a little bit lower in frequency. So what you will hear is something like boop, 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 like uh, the beginning of Mary Poppins. Si sente qualcosa? Yeah, no, no, not this time. But we trust you. You, I mean, you make an, a wonderful uh, sound. Can you hear it or not? The, the, yeah. no, what, 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 you, what you said was perfect. Your imitation was perfect. No, I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is, what now? Yeah, now, now we're here. Oh, it hopefully stops. Yep. Okay. That was my imitation good enough? Yes. Okay, next one, and then I'm going to try and rush through because otherwise we don't finish, is the one of the most spectacular uh, inhabitants of the Ligurian Sea, the, the pilot whale, which we find since 25 years talking in a very similar in a very uh, peculiar dialect, which has repeated. I'm trying to slide change. Maybe it's a, like a little, 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 little slow process because I have another slide on, which is, ah, here we go. So you see that there are repetitive structures in the lower part of the screen, and I'm trying for you to listen to them now. Antonio, could you hear anything? Yes, we did. Okay, this is the sound of the resource dolphin. So the sounds came before the slide. In any case, these are the most frequent, uh, uh, the most uh, peculiar sounds. The most frequent one is that of the striped dolphin, but 
I'm not going to talk about animals anymore. Now we come to the main subject, ships. And uh, I have changed the slide. So whenever you will see a slide of a ship coming up, ships have this particular condition that they cross the oceans in any direction from north to south and east to west and west to east by because they transport goods that we need for living. So trade in the world is made mainly with the help of ships. They are more efficient than other uh, types of uh, moving goods around the, 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 the world because they can be very big, very large in size. The particular thing about ships is that they have a, which is what you see on the screen is called the Lloyd Mirror of a, of a, of a, uh, a merchant ship. They have this particular sound that if you see from left to right, when it approaches and it reaches the uh, shortest point of arrival, the central point of arrival, closest point of arrival in the middle of the screen, and then it goes to the right side, wide opens again. This image, which is called the Lloyd Mirror effect, uh, is, is the signature of each merchant ship. So each and every Ah. Some of these ships uh, have the particular uh, characteristic that they scare animals away, like in this case, which is published about uh, the the Ziphius, the, the, the big whale. And I am trying to go to the next slide, but I'm okay. I have some more examples of ships that are noisy. Okay, I'm, I think I'm done with noise. Uh, noise irradiated by ships depends, comes uh, primarily from the machinery and from the streamline of the, of the hull and mainly from the propeller which turns in the water and produces cavitation. The point is how do we, ships have you, you have seen in, the, in, a, in later slides by Paola, they go across the Mediterranean. I have here some pictures from Emodnet, which I told you know very well if they come up. This is uh, average cargo ships in 2019. And this is uh, August and the, and the slide is August and December in 2019. You see that there is a seasonality in shipping routes. How do we regulate that? This was the main uh, question for the TG Noise, which is the technical group of other noise in the EU. How do we regulate that? After years of discussions and of scientific consultations, we came to the idea of setting threshold values for, um, for the uh, shipping noise in the, in the European seas. And the, the slide will come up eventually. So it's two slides ahead this. It will take some time to come over to Genoa. Um, we decided that for impulsive noise, which is the banging noise, which we've heard for short term, there must be acceptable, no more than 20% uh, insolification over one year. And for long-term exposure, 10% in uh, for what concerns continuous noise, we decided that the maximum that can be ever in sonified is 20% of all the seas, and that on a monthly basis over one year. What that in practice means is yet to be uh, tested by the member states of the EU, because nobody has yet tested these this, uh, threshold values. The good news is that we now have threshold values. So we have a regulamentation for the European seas. This is the first ever in the world. And uh, once, even if those, if those threshold values are not perfect, they are a good point of starting point for 
regulating noise in the in the in the European seas. I hope that future will bring adjustments to this, but I am happy that we have started because it it took a long time to to uh, to come to these uh, values. I hope I'm not too much over time, and uh, I thank you for listening. Sorry for the technical inconvenience. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. It was. Uh... I would say it was a quite noisy presentation, but it was fun. <laughs> so, but while waiting for the, the outcome of uh, this, uh, I mean, wonderful exercise that TG Noise uh, has been done uh, lately, we can also start having some practical action in order to, I mean, mitigate the noise, especially in some areas that have a very big value. So I would like to invite uh, Noelia Ortega on the stage to talk about the marine protected areas and social well-being and economic prosperity. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having CTN here and having me. Well, uh, I don't know whether Fabrizio is still here, but okay. I say hello to Fabrizio. <laughs> so, well, let me show you another phase of sustainability. And I'm going to talk about a project, but let me introduce myself first. Uh, I don't know, sorry, Valeria? No, the one down. Okay, so this is me. I'm the director of CTN, that is a marine technology center located in Cartagena, very near to Alicante, where the ocean rates started. So I'm, I'm very near to the beginning, and I'm at the end of the ocean rates, so I'm very happy. And just uh, last week, I was in The Hague. That was the previous stage of the air race, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm also advisor of the European Commission, because I'm going to talk to you to, uh, about one European project. Uh, about sustainability and about uh, and marine protected areas. You have my data here, and you can connect through LinkedIn with me, uh, uh, sending me an invitation. And this is CTN. This is the technology center that are uh, a private organization, but not for profit. We are a maritime cluster of companies that aim to boost innovation and blue economy by supporting sustainability, digital and digital transformation. And this is the project I'm going to talk about that is effective project, a project that uh, kicked off two weeks ago in Brussels. And it's about enhancing social well-being and economic prosperity by reinforcing the protection and restoration management in the marine protected areas in the Mediterranean. However, the results can be applied to any marine protected area in, around the world. So this is the policy context. It's a bit complex, but remember that the 2030 Agenda for, for Sustainable Development and the EU Biodiversity Strategy and the European Green Deal, that is a, a trend that is, is very strong for all of us. And the EU mission, that is a program a specific uh, tool of the European Commission to promote solution for restoring our oceans and, and waters. And in this uh, big program, the EU mission, oceans, we can have four different areas, like the Baltic and North, the Mediterranean, the Danube, and the Atlantic and Arctic coast. And the aim of this big program is to protect and restore the waters and the uh, ecosystem and biodiversity. And if you go to this project just a little more, we can find the, the mission objectives and targets. And the effective project I'm going to talk about is aligned with this uh, European targets and with this uh, political context. But let me check the, the route, the path from the politic to our project. And our project aims to, to uh, sorry, let me go away. So this project aims to promote large large-scale marine protected areas around the Mediterranean Sea. And we want to do this by, by uh, developing 
this innovative marine eco ecosystem restoration solution, you can see, that contribute to restore the bottom of the seas in the marine protected areas. And also, the data are very important in this project, we are working together in this, uh, Antonio, that is building the digital twin of the ocean. I don't know whether you are familiar with this term, but the, the, main, the main reason is to collect data to connect all this information to be able to, to not only to visualize or to monitor what is happening in the ocean, but also to do better forecasting and simulation, um, also to support the management of this area. So we, will ha we are going to develop different uh, technologies. We are also connect with different platforms and information systems. Uh, like Emotnet and like GEOs and, and all this information system to be able to, to have this digital twin of this marine protected area to support the management. That is not easy at all. So what we also want in this project is to uh, involve governance, participation and the social engagement because uh, with a participation, participatory pillar that we are talking about, but because what we want, what, what this project end is to, um, to support the application of the ecosystem-based management framework. We know the term ecosystem approach because it was developed around the 60s, so, but this um, approach that takes into account the natural the ecosystem, while you want to develop any activity, is not easy at all to apply. There are lots of barriers, a lot of difficulties. Uh, you can see that around the year we have been evolving this ecosystem approach concept from the new environmental paradigm to the social ecological paradigm involving the people there. But there are challenges uh, and in practice, the ecosystem approach is not easy to apply because of the policy fragmentation. The marine protected area, the sea, doesn't have borders. But in practical ways, there are borders between member states, between regions, between different um, uh, stakeholders or interests, uh, borders between the social, borders between uh, the economical activities, borders between the political framework, so we know that there is a great, a big, huge policy fragmentation. There's also the dilemma of the Babel Tower, and too many concepts, and it's very difficult to have an integrative vision of what uh, should be this uh, ecosystem approach. That's why we have a team behind the project about, with nine countries, more than 22 organizations, and more than 100 people working together to build this, this challenge of having a marine protected area. We are going to, to perform four pilots, one in, in the Mediterranean, one in Mar de Porda, that is in the north of Spain, also in the Delta del Ebro Bay, and we have other in, in, in Portugal and other in uh, Chipre. So, but these are the pilot, but the solution can be uh, uh, extrapolated to other areas in Europe. And to continue with this, I want to play this video. It has some, because I think it's, a, it's better <laughs> that, uh, to see this is the, the, the a video of the European Commission. I don't, know, it's, I don't know why it's not running, the sound, and the sound is very beautiful, also the images. So, I don't know if there is a... Well, the Commission is talking about the, the mission here. ...for all of us. Because all life on Earth depends on a healthy ocean and clean waters. The time to act is now. The EU is on a mission to restore and protect our ocean and waters by 2030. How will the mission drive this change? By setting up four mission lighthouses in the Mediterranean Sea, the Baltic and North Sea, the Danube River Basin, and the Atlantic Arctic Basin. The lighthouses will act as hubs that will develop, demonstrate and deploy new solutions far and wide and guide us in our journey to restoring our ocean and waters. The Mission Ocean and Waters will protect and restore aquatic ecosystems, prevent and eliminate pollution, 
and make the blue economy climate neutral and circular. Through this mission, we will achieve a healthy and pollution-free Mediterranean Sea, a carbon neutral and circular economy in the Baltic and North Sea, a more protected and restored Danube River, as well as restored Atlantic Arctic ecosystems and biodiversity. Get on board to be part of this journey. Whether you're a representative from a member state or a region, a business owner or an investor or a caring citizen, you can join us and contribute by co-designing, proposing and implementing activities, projects, campaigns and initiatives. Only by joining forces can we make our ocean and waters healthy again. For our communities, for all life on this planet, now and for future generations. If you need anything, just contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noelia. Thank you so much. So you are addressing one important point. I mean, we are speaking about water. We are speaking. Uh, we are speaking about ocean. We are speaking about waters. We are speaking about earth. So we, we are speaking about the value. But how can we quantify the value of uh, I mean this uh, ecosystem? So I would like to invite uh, Raquel Bordoni to tell about uh, the natural capital and ecosystem services evaluation, a key sustainable development. Good afternoon. I'm Raquel Bordoni, a PhD student. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about natural capital and ecosystem services as key to sustainable development. Uh, it should be crystal clear that the continued loss of ecosystems and biodiversity is endangering the prosperity of both current and future generations. Uh, we, as humans, strongly depend on nature since the success of ecosystem and health of ecosystems provide us essential uh, benefits and services. So, for that reason, the link between natural capital, ecosystem services, and then sustainable development is crucial. But what is natural capital? It refers to all the Earth's natural resources, such as forests, water, minerals, and biodiversity, that provide a wide range of uh, ecological benefits to humans, but also to the ecosystem itself. So, of course, it contributes to the human well-being and to the sustainable development. In 2010, Enos Young and Postin explained how the ecosystem and the socio-economic system are linked together. And the ecosystem services are the join between these two systems. But from the socioeconomic system, we can influence the natural environment through pressures. And of course, we can limit those pressures via policy actions. Uh, through the years, we have, we, people have done uh, many different uh, definitions of ecosystem services, but we can say that they are all the direct and indirect contribution to the ecosystem, of the ecosystems to the human well-being. The first attempt to classify them was, um, comes from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which is a research project uh, called for by the United Nations in the early 21st century and then uh, published in 2005. And they divided the ecosystem services in four main categories. We have the cultural services, such as the recreation, the tourism, the aesthetic value of nature, and also like the spiritual and religious values that are connected to the nature. We have then the uh, provisioning services, such as food, fresh water, and raw materials. We have the regulating services, that are those services that moderate the natural phenomena, like air quality or water quality uh, regulation. And finally, we have the supporting services, the services that enable other ecosystem services to exist, like all the nutrient cycling, the photosynthesis, photosynthesis and the soil formation. 
Okay, let's dig into some numbers to better explain and be uh, highlight the contribution of natural capital. In 2011, the World Bank reported that the natural capital contribution to the national wealth of countries divided by their incomes is, on average, at least one fifth of the overall national wealth. So we are talking about quite relative numbers. And if we talk about ecosystem services, in 2014, uh, famous economist Robert, Robert Costanza uh, tried to assess the values of ecosystem services of several different biomes, and the aggregate global ecosystem service values seems to be 125 trillions of dollars per year. Even here, we are talking about big numbers. So, Valuing natural capital ecosystem services is vital for sustainable development and if you want to move towards a sustainable and prosperous future. And I would say for four main reasons. First of all, it recognizes the economic value of resources, then guides decision makers for making better and informed choices. It aligns with the SDGs and the last but not the least, it promotes stakeholders' engagement and, aware and awareness in these issues. Um, I'm not gonna talk so much about how we can evaluate ecosystem services and natural capital because there are so many different ways that we don't have enough time to do it. But if you are curious, we can talk about it later. But what can I say is that it's easier to assess the value for single ecosystems. Here you can see like for beach forest trees, uh, for beach trees forest, for Posidonia oceanica, or at local or regional scale, like for uh, um, marine protected areas and uh, for all the uh, region, like uh, the, uh, the Liguria region. So it's easier to access the data and also a research group directly sample the data that they need to do these valuations. So what do we need? We need open, shared, interoperable, accessible data to make broader scale valuations. So to have values for different locations around the globe and then make them comparable and understand the, situa the situation we are in and how we can change, how we, what can, can we do. And tools like Copernicus or Imonet are extremely important in that, in the make this data open and, and shareable. So yeah, I just want to conclude saying that we have to take care of the natural world, not just because we are part of it, but because we strongly depend on it. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Thank, thank you, Raquel, thank you very much. Actually, I would like to say that we, I mean, did not plan any question and answer here in the interest of saving some time for having a break in order to refresh ourselves because they are very warm days. So the idea is now to go and refresh ourselves and while refreshing ourselves, taking a coffee, we can also get close to the speakers and ask directly some questions if we want to dig into details. So have, uh, help yourself and we, uh, we start again in uh, 20, 50 minutes, 20 minutes. I call for, uh, for it.
Okay. So we 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 took a break that is longer than it was supposed, <laughs> but I, I guess that the discussion is so nice that we can keep talking for hours about uh, all the amazing things that we are uh, have already seen this morning. I mean this afternoon, but we need to. To, to go on because there are other presentations that are also very interesting. So to avoid to lose more time, I would like to invite on the stage Valentina Snaghi from the university, and she is going to present us on when protected is no longer enough, ecological restoration in coastal zones. So Valentina, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm happy to be here today for telling you a little bit about what we are doing in terms of ecological restoration uh, along the Ligurian coast uh, as uh, the Bentic College Lab of uh, this staff of the University of Genova. Uh, so okay. <laughs> so, um, Speaking about sustainability, we have to uh, define a little bit what we mean um, with two terms that are directly related with the uh, interaction of human beings and nature. Uh, my colleagues at uh, talk before me, uh, Rachele and also Nelia already introduced very well uh, all this concept, so I can go very fast, but um, I want to stress this difference between the protection of the nature, that was the first approach that has been implemented for um, uh, in, the, in the relationship between human beings and, and nature, that's seen the, um, the nature as a natural reserve, so something to be pr protected and untouched. Then after the Convention on Biological Diversity, we shift a little bit our concept to conservation. Conservation includes also the use, the sustainable and sensible use of natural resources. Sorry. All this uh, is, of course, uh, um, reported also in all the uh, EU environmental policies in the last um, years that uh, follow these uh, different steps from protection to conservation. But unfortunately, um, most of the, a lot of ecosystems are uh, arrived at a level of damage that um, need a active interve intervention of human well-being. So as my, the title of my pre presentation anticipated, the protection and conservation is no longer enough. And we need to talk about restoration ecology. Uh, this is uh, found in all the uh, policy uh, actually uh, present in the EU and the um, UN, and in particular the uh, already mentioned EU biodiversity strategy started to talk about the importance of uh, restoring our ecosystem. And we presently are in the decade for ecosystem restoration, um, and uh, very recently, in during this month, uh, has been, uh, uh, there has been an agreement on the EU natural restoration law that uh, foresee the, um, restor uh, the restoration of at least 20% of marine and 20% of uh, terrestrial ecosystem by 2030 and the, of all the ecosystems in need by uh, 2050. But uh, a restoration intervention needs to be effective and sustainable. With effective, I mean that uh, we need to use uh, uh, appropriate technique for the specific habitat as, and species. And uh, we need to be flexible and the approach should be modifiable as a function of the environmental uh, challenges that we meet. Uh, the approach should be applicable at a large scale and this is one of the main challenges nowadays. And uh, it needs to include a broad engagement involving both citizens, uh, uh, policymakers, and stakeholders in general. Uh, in terms of su sustainability, the approach should be not harmful, of course, for donor population and also for the ecosystem that is target of uh, the restoration. And uh, uh, there is a need of using approaches and materials that are eco-friendly and sustainable in order not to harm the environment uh, that we are targeting. 
speaking about a sustainable approach uh, to restore, uh, we need to think about uh, um, the use of uh, reproduction in controlled environment. So uh, this will uh, allow to not uh, harm the donor population, not, so not transferring organisms from one place to another, but uh, creating new individuals uh, through the, uh, the, the, the production in laboratory. If you think this is uh, quite uh, um, common in terrestrial environment, because no, no one is surprised thinking about uh, cultivating plants for storing a forest, but it is uh, still at its infancy for the marine environment. So this is a, a collection of the project that we carried out uh, during the last years uh, as uh, uh, Bentic Ecology Lab, but in collaboration also with the other colleague of, the, the, of our department, the Seascape Ecology Lab and the System Ecology Research Group. And uh, we are, I'm going to tell you a little bit of each one of these. These projects are all founded uh, mainly by the LIFE pro uh, program, but uh, we will see also um, through the National Biodiversity Future Center. Okay, the first project that we, we are seeing is the Relife project, which, which has the target to reintroduce along the Ligurian coast a gastropod, an endemic gastropod, Patella ferruginea, which is a, a, an endangered species and is a very charismatic species because it's a very nice shell. And, um, it, it is uh, almost completely lost along the Ringurian coast. The donor site is the Tabolara MPA, uh, and the approach, as I told you, is to collect uh, organisms from Tabolara, but not to translocate them, but to um, use them for producing new organisms in the, in the lab. And that's what we did. We obtained the first induction of spawning uh, without uh, um, damaging the organism, without sacrificing the organism. And we uh, were able to follow all the life stages, the larval stages, reaching to the settlement of the, the gastropod. And uh, uh, we produced more than uh, 1,600 uh, juveniles uh, to be reintroduced along the Ligurian coast. Uh, so with the non-lethal technique uh, and uh, uh, using a limited number of, uh, of brood, brood stock. Uh, once the organisms uh, were big enough to survive in the environment, they, they have been translocated uh, along the, the Lingurian coast with uh, um, dedicated support. Uh, with the experience that we have uh, done with Patella ferruginea, we are presently um, targeting another species, another mollusk, which is uh, Pina nobilis, uh, that uh, has uh, encountered a, a really a drastic decline in the last year, starting from 2016, uh, a real pandemic that um, caused the, um, the death of most of most uh, of the, the organisms along all the Mediterranean coasts. So very recently, a couple of weeks ago, 10 individuals arrived at our lab um, from the Venice Lagoon. I have to say that we did a very large research for uh, searching for uh, safe individuals that are not affected by the uh, pathogens that are um, causing this decline. And uh, we find this organism in the Venice Lagoon. Um, this research has been done also with the help of citizens because we have a also an involvement of a citizen. And uh, presently, these organisms are, are in our lab in Camogli, and um, they uh, were able to uh, release uh, already fertilized eggs, and my colleagues presently very hardly working in uh, following in the first larva stages. So you, you can see some of the picture here. Uh, we have um, a, the, the, the organism uh, releasing eggs and uh, after some of the stages uh, of the larval development. Always in terms of uh, 
reproduction, uh, sustainable reproduction in a controlled environment and also use of eco-friendly material. Uh, we had two projects, uh, one is concluded, Rock Pop Life, and the other is uh, in progress now, about the uh, restoration of macroalgal forests and in particular of Elkaria mentacea, which is the brown algae, uh, very sensitive and uh, um, uh, which uh, is, in, is indicator of a good uh, environmental status. Uh, the approach, the sustainable approach that we developed with Rock Pop is uh, called out planting. So we take small fertile parts of the adult organism and we are able to um, grow the juveniles from this uh, small part on uh, tiles that we will after place along the coast. We use a sustainable material, as I told you. So we have uh, uh, these clay tiles uh, with different uh, shape and also different texture uh, that we produce ourselves, sometimes with the help of students, as you can see in the picture. And then we, uh, after letting the juveniles grow on the tiles, we place them directly in the rocks. And as you can see in the picture below, uh, from one year to the other, we have the, the juveniles grow on the, on the tiles and we create the new forest along the coast. We are doing the same, ah, sorry, what I've shown you has been done in Cinque Terre MPA and now we are doing the same in Bergeggi MPA uh, where a storm destroyed a stretch of coast and uh, um, caused the decline of the forest there. And uh, yesterday we were in the sea for placing the first uh, 100 tiles with uh, the juveniles in the framework of uh, reforest project. Another project on, on uh, Ericaria Mentacea is uh, Restart, uh, is a project that comes from challenges and give us some opportunities. So um, following a big storm that you for sure remember uh, that destroyed the street going towards Portofino, um, a, a, a wall has been constructed uh, close to the, um, the sea surface and what we will do is to um, uh, use our technique to, re to introduce a marine forest along this artificial structure. So taking advantage of a of a problem to produce new uh, opportunities. Another uh, restoration uh, approach that we are carrying out in, uh, presently is the um, cultivation of Posidonia seeds. We collected several seeds from the sea, floating from the sea, and we are uh, growing them in the lab with the aim of planting them using a biomat uh, on the seafloor. So, concluding, uh, it is essential to have a good basic knowledge of the species or habitat that is target of our restoration uh, project and it's fundamental to use sustainable approaches. Um, we are happy to say that our small scale action seems to have very successful result, but now we, move to, we need to move to large scale application. And when I say uh, large scale application, I don't mean a single large scale event, but um, uh, thinking at a larger scale also in terms of collaboration with several different research groups. In this, most probably the National Biodiversity Future Center, and in particular the group on marine ecosystem restoration, we give us the opportunity of, of working on this. Okay. I have to thank all my colleagues that are here today, in particular the group of Seascape Ecology Lab, the group of uh, System Ecology Research, and uh, uh, my colleague uh, of the Laboratory of Ecologia d'Erbentos, um, because uh, they are amazing, and I'm really happy to work with them. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much. You presented some, I mean, very inter interesting techniques in order to do and restore some of the things but we need to take care about I mean the, the seas because there are some threads that have I mean can also affect I mean the uh, the growing of the I mean of the, the seeds so alkalinity is one problem and so I would like to invite um, um, Elizabeth Kuben to talk us about understanding the impact of the ocean acidification
Okay, hello to everybody. Um, I'm Elizabeth Kubin from OGS Trieste. And today I'm going to talk about the impact of ocean acidification. Um, so what is ocean acidification? Because in the media everywhere we hear a lot about man-made climate change, about the combustion of fossil fuels, and as a consequence also of the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, and this, as a consequence, um, leads also to, a, to an increase of the partial pressure, pressure of CO2 in the seawater. So an example is for, uh, a mineral bottle. If you op open the mineral bottle, um, you see all these, this bubbling that is coming out. So in the sea, is happening actually the contrary. So the sea is taking a lot of CO2. And um, since pre-industrial times, the ocean has absorbed about 30% of the emitted anthropogenic carbon. And this is causing the ocean acidification. So here are some graphs. On the left side, you see the, um, the mean CO2 from 1980 to 2020, the increase. And on the right side, you see the decrease of the seawater pH from Copernicus from 1985 to 2019. So, um, um, also to quantify um, these processes, the data is very important. So, I'm working with Emonet Chemistry, and I just wanted to show um, also the work that we are doing. So, we are trying to, to create fair data sets for biogeochemical data, and now also for ocean acidification. So, fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And to describe um, the carbonate system, we also need to include other parameters like total alkalinity, total dissolved inorganic carbon, and the partial pressure of CO2. And we also need um, standard metadata and the common vo vocabulary. So um, from the British Oceanographic Data Center. And we also create um, vocabulary. So we also um, extend the list um, how ocean acidification is measured, so which instruments are used, and um, yes. And for this, uh, we try also to, um, to create a worldwide ocean acidification database together with UNESCO. And we also created a metadata template which collects the most important uh, metadata. So we also presented our work at the Fifth World Ocean Climate Conference in Bergen. Um, to come back uh, to the ocean acidification, so what's, what is happening? Um, the increased um, CO2 in the seawater reacts with the water and it forms carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid splits into one hydrogen ion and the one bicarbonate ion. And <coughs> this hydrogen ion combines with the carbonate ion from the seawater which is leading to a decrease of the carbonate ion concentration and also to the calcium carbonate concentration. And this, um, the calcium carbonate is required for the shell formation and this um, decline makes it harder for the shells to, uh, for the organisms to create their shells. Um, we have also three forms of calcium carbonate, which is ar aragonite, calcite and magnesium calcite. So calcite is quite stable, while aragonite and magnesium calcite um, is very much, um, it's more soluble. So I just want to give some facts. Since the beginning of industrialization, the average pH of seawater has fallen from about 8.2 to 8.1. So 0 0.1 doesn't seem a lot of difference. Dif um, it doesn't seem much, but the pH has a logarithmic scale, and so 0 0.1 um, decrease in pH um, corresponds to a 30% increase in acidity. And this also corresponds to a decrease of 30% in carbonate concentration. Um, the projection for the year 2100 shows a decrease of 0 0.3 pH units which corresponds to a decrease of 50% in carbonate concentration. And what's, what we also need to know is that colder water absorbs more CO2. So the ocean acidification will, will affect um, colder water sooner. 
And these global pH changes are very likely to cause 20% of the ocean, of the surface ocean, specifically the Arctic and Southern Oceans, as well as the Northern Pacific and Northwest Atlantic Oceans, to experience year-round corrosive conditions for Aragonite by 2100. And if you look at this graph, uh, here you can see the Aragonite saturation state, and the dark red shows the values um, which are smaller than one, and this um, shows a corrosive state, which means the solution of shells. And this is going to happen in 2100 in Arctic waters and in Antarctic waters. So what does this actually mean for marine organisms and the functioning of the ecosystem? Um, as we all know, um, the ocean food web is very complex and everything is connected with everything and dependent on each other. So, also the food chains are shifted by decreasing pH value. And also, the fish that we eat, such as haddock, halibut, flounder, and cod, they feed mainly on mollusks. And these mollusks, they create their shells, and they have problems to build their shells in a more acidic environment. And yes, so we see that the smallest, that the largest animals on Earth depend on the smallest ones. So if, we change, if the change is going too fast, the ecosystem has difficulties to adapt. And just to give an example, the krill here uh, feeds mainly on phytoplankton, but the largest animal on the world, which is the blue whale, can be up to 30 meters um, here in New Zealand. It's uh, from a picture from a friend of mine. And it feeds off of this very, very small animal. Then um, different types of marine calcifying organisms, they respond in very different ways. And I just want to mention some, like the corals. They are aragonite producers, and therefore they're very sensitive to ocean acidification. Um, the southern ocean will be affected most rapidly, and by the end of the century, 70% of the current coral habitats could no longer be suitable. Then there are also studies on mollusks. So on the edible mussel, Mytilus edulis, which we also have here in the Mediterranean, the Pacific oyster, and they also show that the calcification rate decreases at elevated PCO2. And also um, the, the larvae re react. Um, these two species, they are also very important for the coastal ecosystems and also for, um, for the economy. Mm, we have also the echinodermata with the starfishes and the sea urchins. And their skeleton consists of magnesium calcite, which is even more soluble than aragonite. And the larvae become smaller and show an anomalies. Um, what is important to, to mention is that the largest producers of calcium carbonate are the coccolithophores, the foraminifera, and the decosomata. And just to give you an idea, um, on the left side you can see the coccolithophores, which are very, very small. They're like, uh, this is a picture from electron microscopy, and this is like one thousandth of, of your hair on the size. Um, then you have the foraminifera, they are also very beautiful. They have a diameter of about 200 micrometers. And then the decosomata, which is very beautiful. It's a sea butterfly and often called also sea angel, which is smaller than one centimeter. Mm. And these three calcifiers, they are responsible for almost the entire transport of calcium carbonate from the surface ocean into the deep sea. And this is called um, the biological pump, which you can see here. And the foraminifera and the coccolithophores, um, they form their shells from calcite, um, while the decosomata form their shells from aragonite. And aragonite is about 50% more soluble in seawater than calcite. So um, the sea butterflies um, will have um, a hard time, and as a consequence also the, the food webs that depends on these, um, on these batteropods because um, the sea butterfly is also an important source of food for the juvenile Pacific salmon. And here you can also see how the shell is, is dissolving. 
So the solutions, which solutions are there? There are some technical solutions, or there are, um, for example, fertilization, then the idea of putting lime into the ocean, CO2 removals, but um, these technical solutions can also be very dangerous because they have side effects and um, they for sure also have still unknown side effects. And in some cases, they may also increase the ocean acidification. And these technical solutions, they do not try to solve the cause of the problem, but they resolve only the symptom. So what we need more probably is a change in life philosophy, which means like um, have respect for the earth and the ocean, um, to, to realize that we are interconnected with all living and non-living things, and that we also, um, yes, collaborate instead of, of have, um, that we have more competition, because of course competition is polluting if you always want to have more, if you want to be better. So this is a big factor of pollution. And of course we need to reconnect with nature, and there we can learn a lot from indigenous people, because indigenous people, they own very little land, but they have, in this little land, they have very, very high biodiversity. So they, they need to do something good. Or they, 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 they are doing something good. Um, and of course, we need to go to the root of the problem, which means uh, to decrease the CO2 emissions. And also the IPCC special report states um, that if you want to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need a transformative systemic change integrated with sustainable development. And yes, so we need to change our par paradigm of eternal growth on a finite planet. We need a living stewardship of the earth. And yes, I want to finish with, um, with a quote I like a lot. If you want to travel happily, travel light and with little luggage. This also applies to the journey of life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. Elizabeth. But, yeah, you said we need to reduce the CO2, <laughs> and, but we, can all, we also need to think about some more sustainable use of the areas that uh, uh, we can, I mean, we already are using for other purposes because we, there is an increase in demand also for food from the sea. So we need to think about new solutions in which we can uh, I mean, grow food from the sea, take food from the sea, but we can also mitigate the effect that we apply to the, the, the sea. So I would like to invite Ovenit Berg, that is going to present us some solutions that we are developing in the Olamur project. Ovenit, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, I spoke with you yesterday, so, so, at least some of you, on the National Norwegian project. But, uh, okay, let's see, you find this, ah, oh, this is good. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> it's, co it's coming, coming. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about the Ulamur project, uh, which is a European flagship project. We're demonstrating open use, open ocean, multi-use of area with offshore low traffic aquaculture in multi-use scenario or resolution, realization. <laughs> and that is a long name for using an area for two different purposes, or at least, at least two, because there are more. We have a large EU project, it's a flagship project, where we produce kelps and mussels within offshore fish farms. We address some bottlenecks hampering development of commercially viable and sustainable offshore low trophic aquaculture in wind farms or fish farms. EU has had a lot of projects on developing that kind of systems, but no one actually doing it. This time it is real. We are doing it now in the large scale. The wind farms are there. The fish farm is there. We are setting out the low trophic aquaculture in large scale now, as we speak. We are 25 partners from research, organization, and industry. And as you see, we're quite dominated by the North. The reason for that is that this is a Baltic North Sea uh, scenario. We go in in the Baltic Sea and the North Sea and do things that are designed for those waters. But we do have a partner here in Genova, and that is Antonio and Julia and Beatrice who are working on the project here. 
Also, David Bassett, who will talk immediately after me, is a partner in the Ulamur project. But the rest of the partners is a mixture of research institutes and uh, various companies, including both aquaculture and wind energy companies. These are our three si sites where we do actually do our work. In case A is in Germany, it's outside close to the island of Helgoland. For those who know it, it's a small island out in the North Sea where the company Merlint is operating a large scale wind farm. Here in Denmark, actually, it, this is the point where the zones of Sweden, Denmark, and Germany meet. Uh, that is the call, a place called Kriegersflak. Uh, it's a fish known by, by some Navy captain some a couple of hundred years ago who found it. And it's also known as a, as a, as a fish area. Uh, it's the largest uh, offshore wind farm in Europe, at least, at, at present. And it's operational. It, there are wind farms both on the Danish and German sides, and the Swedes are setting up something in them as well. And we are coming in with our mussels and kelp. And up in, further into the, to the, to the Baltic is the Estonian waters. It's uh, close to the island of uh, Ösel in German, or Sarema in Estonian, uh, where there is fish farming going on. Uh, now, as you know, uh, the Baltic is heavily overloaded with nutrients. If you can see what the countries that surrounds, uh, surrounds uh, uh, the Baltic, uh, it drains the rivers from Poland, the Baltic countries, Sweden, Finland, not to mention Russia and Belarus. And it, the rivers go all the way down to the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and U even Ukraine. Uh, so there are lots of nutrients coming out into the sea. So in the coastal zone also, we have merry maritime uses. We have stress on coastal ecosystems. Demand for space is increasing. The coastal zones are the most valuable zones we have. We have. Uh, a large fraction of Europe's and the world's uh, population are living in the coastal zone as well. Uh, often we have single-use management. We can't go on like that if we want to increase the use of the ocean, so we have to move out into the ocean. Furthermore, you have lots of opportunities. You have decommissioning of oil platforms. Uh, you have a lot of fisheries going on. And of course, you have the possibility you know, that the wind farming is moving offshore. So multi-use of ocean space, uh, which means that we have the same space. We maximize the spatial efficiency. We can leave all the space free. So we don't have to use all the space. We can share services data management, infrastructure, and we can even avoid conflicts because there are conflicts between different users of an area. So in a regional scale, we can also mitigate restoration and regenerative services like cultivating kelp to increase the plant production in the sea. We can do nutrient and carbon capture and utilization of these nutrients, making the, what is a problem today to be a resource in the future. And we can improve the water quality. So that can even be better for the fish and for the people surrounding, the, especially the Baltic, but also the North Sea. In a global scale, we are mitigating at a large scale. First of all, we are producing energy in these multi-use parks. Renewable, clean energy. What we know very well from tragic reasons in Europe recently, that the, this continent desperately needs more of. We are also mitigating a food security crisis. We are even mit mitigating the climate crisis because we are producing renewable energy and we are also capturing CO2 through the kelp farming. If, regarding the food safe, safe security crisis, you should all know that this continent is uh, heavily dependent on import of uh, seafood. Uh, seafood. So, there are lots of challenges of multi-use. Licensing, it vary, varies, not, even, not, all, not only among countries, but even within countries. The different German Länder, or uh, provinces, you might say, have, div have different uh, uh, rules for this. The hydrodynamics, the competing use. The salinity can be a challenge, especially in the Baltic, because not all org organisms can grow in there. Nutrient status is also different. Wind and wave conditions are different. The growth potentials for mussels and seaweed are also different. 
Uh, my colleague Marie Maur in uh, Aarhus at the Aarhus University have done some harvest calculations of the harvesting potential on uh, blue mussels and on sugar kelp in Danish waters, demonstrating that there is a large unused potential for producing uh, biomass from these low trophic organisms, the blue mussels utilizing the algae and particles and even bacteria from the sea. Whereas the sugar kelp utilizes, as you know, they are plants. They utilize nutrients and sunlight. The production potential is large. That's the bottom line here. So what are the target audience of the Ulamur? Of course, we have regional, national, and EU agencies. We have low trophic agriculture farmers, technology providers. We will also include five associated regions. We're very very uh, curious about how that will go, but we will include and invite in other regions from associated countries and member states of the Union that can actually do, do uh, utilize Ulamur technology in their regions, thereby ensure uh, that it, a better spreading of the knowledge and a better uh, communication. Of course, also the climate research community is in, in our target. So we can reduce the excessive nitrogen and phosphorus components by seaweeds and excess algal growths can be used by mussels. We can thus improve water quality and allow, therefore, also for more fish farming. Of course, there's a lot of European policies behind this. This is a part of the mission uh, for uh, seas and oceans. It's a part of the mission for the Baltic. And underneath this, there's, for instance, the sustainable algal sector, the EU MSP sector platform, uh, and a lot of the Mission Ocean Ch Charter is central here, and uh, the Horizon Europe Framework Program, of course. So it, uh, it's heavily anchored in uh, European policies. Uh, it's, a part, it's a lighthouse of the Baltic and the North Sea basins. Uh, to, so they're doing this in the large scale. Actually, the overall goal is to make a better Baltic and a better North Sea. So this is our address, and this is our website. You're more than welcome to visit us. Thank you, Ovini. Thank you very much, because this is an amazing, uh, I mean, a very interesting project. But we also need platform to share this knowledge. So, I mean, a platform like a, uh, AI Tip. So I would like to ask uh, David to present on uh, the activities and how we can share this expertise once we develop. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Um, I, unfortunately, which one is it? I wrote down for the next one, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't be at this event on Tuesday or yesterday because I had meetings I was attending in Rome. Uh, so aquaculture uh, has featured uh, yesterday and today, but uh, Tuesday and yesterday, um, but I'm delighted uh, to be able to come and speak today. Many thanks for the invitation, Antonio. Many thanks um, uh, for, uh, and congratulations on a successful event. And can we just congratulate Antonio on his exceptional taste in neckties? Because for those of you who are observing it, I'm delighted because Italy is famed for its elegance and style. And um, indeed, they actually had an 80% discount sale in the shop. So I think that's probably the reason we were both there. But, um, but it's always good. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been asked to talk on the topic of between biodiversity and sustainability, science to raise awareness and awareness to guide decisions. Um, my name is David Bassett. I represent the European Aquaculture Technology and Innovation Platform. Uh, and so I'll give you the perspectives of that. Before I um, go, where am I pointing this? Uh, yes. Um, how many of you in the room actually know what a technology platform is? One person. That's better than nothing. But saying as only one person does, it, it, excuse me while I take two minutes just to explain the concept of a technology platform. They first get referenced back in about 2002 with something called the Lisbon Strategy. Very worryingly for me, some of you in the room may not actually have been alive at the point that the Lisbon Strategy was announced, which I find very aging, but never mind. Um, there was a Lisbon Strategy announced, uh, which uh, expressed a desire, a typically low-key European Union desire, 
for the EU to become the world's global leading knowledge-based bioeconomy. However, within that, there was an acknowledgement that um, there was insufficient integration of sectoral industry, societal needs, science and research. So one agreed way of helping to uh, work on that were for technology platforms to be established, which are multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, so uh, the bringing together of science, research, industry, civil society groups, NGO, policy and governance to agree a vision to agree a strategic research and innovation agenda, and to agree steps necessary for the implementation of research outputs to address bottlenecks to innovation, mobilization, and dissemination of research, um, technology, development, and innovation. Um, the key tasks of technology platforms are to identify strategic research and innovation agendas, encourage industry participation in the EU-funded framework programs, um, and um, to facilitate uh, the development of partnerships, communication, and dissemination. If you're interested in that, then there's a link there to a European Parliament think tank um, paper that summarizes the history of what they are. So that's a bit of context of, of what a technology platform is. Who are we? Well, we're one of the 39 technology platforms there are. We were established back in uh, 2008. We attempt uh, or are open to representing the entire aquaculture sector, so be that finfish or shellfish or algae, be that marine water, fresh water, recirculating systems, and so forth. We're privately funded through our membership um, and we're industry-led. Uh, we operate to an agreed strategic research and innovation agenda that's prepared in alignment with the sustainable development goals. Um, and our strategic research and innovation agenda covers three key thematic areas and nine chapters, covering aquaculture and the consumer, issues surrounding sustainability, and aquaculture and society. So that's anything from consumer uh, safety and product quality through to specific issues relating to aquatic animal health and welfare. We also, within our multi-stakeholder mem membership, I referenced industry, academia, research, civil society groups, NGAs. We also have a category called mirror platforms. And the mirror platforms are national or regional clusters that are also in themselves multi-stakeholder platforms. We currently have 16 national or regional mirror platforms. Um, it gives us an organizational reach in excess of 800 members and helps us drive a very bottom-up approach when considering what research and innovation priorities there are how to communicate and consult with members, um, how to disseminate results, and how to represent stakeholder views. Just because I'm here in Italy today, and what a joy it is, I'll put a little slide in for Italy. You get full marks, congratulations, um, because of our Italian associations and organizations, never mind individual producers, uh, we have ISPRA, who is a member, we have ITACWA, which is the mirror platform, uh, and then we have, um, forgive the pronunciation, the Associazioni Piscatorellini Italiani, uh, API, uh, which is the producer's organization representing the aquaculture sector. Um, all are very active in it. Italians are not quiet, I have learned in my years in engaging. Not always correct, but um, never quiet. Uh, all are very active, all uh, you, you fully engage your views. And in terms of areas, we've had a lot of um, successful working, particularly with ISPRA and ITACWA. They're very interested in data use uh, and looking at zoning and planning, particularly the allocated zones for aquaculture. And ISPRA has done some really groundbreaking work um, on modeling and satellite technology that can be used that we're using to showcase to other European member states um, of some of the advancements in technology that have been made. Um, uh, there are also two, there's a representative of uh, Finfish and Shellfish on our board of directors who are Italian, so you're well represented, and thank you very much for doing that. I don't get to say that in all the member states, but I can say, I can say it in this one. So just to try and map what we do, um, I am not claiming um, that uh, the world is flat. I am not claiming that ETIP is at the center of it, especially in the town of Geneva, where Christopher Columbus was born. Um, but I have to try and map it somehow. Um, so we work with the producer federations, research networks, food alliances, 
other European technology platforms, the Commission itself, um, the Aquaculture Advisory Command Council, NGO groups, and also international collaboration, uh, which is another area we work with. So we work with FAO or, uh, for example, ICES and the emerging European partnerships um, into providing a uh, discussion and communication forum uh, for research and innovation. So what are we actually working on? Well, here, fortunately, I can save a bit of time because between Noelia and uh, Ivan, various things have been referenced this afternoon and have obviously been referenced in the last two days. The two big areas for us are Horizon Europe uh, and the framework program, the ninth framework program that it is, and Horizon Europe, which is helping to support mission restore our ocean and waters. I won't go over that information again because we've heard it. Uh, but within Horizon Europe, there's Cluster 6, which is the bioeconomy cluster, um, which is the one we engage with principally, although there are also clusters on data and security and other areas um, where we would be involved. Um, within Mission Ocean, again to flag, there is an environmental focus of the mission, um, but it includes specific uh, priority areas of low impact and zero carbon aquaculture. So we are specified within Mission Ocean as an area of focus. Um, and particularly within the lighthouse, within um, the particular area of uh, the North Sea and Baltic. And as Oyvind has just referenced in the previous talk, we're engaged, our own organization, my, the platform I represent, is engaged as a project partner in that Olomoa project. The focus in terms of aquaculture policy at the moment tends to be on lower trophic, so we're looking at integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, marine multi-use and coexistence, approaching and applying the principles of circularity and zero waste to aquaculture, and the introduction of nature-based solutions and ecosystem services to aquaculture. And happily, that chimes with some of the presentations we've been listening to this afternoon. And it's always gratifying when you come at the end and you have already sent your slides in that they've actually turned out to be relevant to what the other speakers were saying um, and that you're not making up completely incoherent statements in your presentation. So that all fits together with what we're trying to do. I would also flag that other actions are available. We don't have time to go into them all, but there is more than Horizon Europe, um, uh, and there is more than the mission. There are many other research calls. There are Marie Curie calls. There are other areas of work. Um, that do exist, and I wouldn't want to think that they're overlooked. A second area to focus on, um, it's certainly if you work in the blue economy sector, it's an expression you'll all be That's something that we're looking at doing, registering an interest as a community of practice for the aquaculture sector. Different levels of innovation can be identified um, from uh, highly commercialized, high TRL level innovation outputs through to much more basic TRL level networking and communication and, and, and collaborative initiatives to try and foster and provoke, promote knowledge exchange across Europe. Formalization of the process is necessary through the inclusion of regional development departments and local government. Um, for us, that would mean the local government department would have to have flagged aquaculture as an area of consideration. Um, again, within Italy, congratulations, you're very proactive about listing that as an area of regional development and, and, and prioritization. Um, and it's an area, again, of how ground-based, bottom-up knowledge sharing can help drive a sector. Um, finally, some other areas that we get involved in. Um, there's no point in having knowledge and research projects if you don't communicate and disseminate the results and try and make them available. So we run thematic forums and online uh, project uh, dissemination results. We target the educated and interested rather than the general public, not that I'm calling the general public uneducated, but um, uh, although you wonder sometimes, but, um, and I come from the UK, so I'll, I'll forgive myself for saying that, but um, we uh, target those interested in the sector already um, in trying to promote and showcase communication outputs. Uh, we've worked in the past, because this will be relevant to the work you've heard about over the last couple of days, we've worked with Emodnet and Copernicus um, on looking at data use, marine data for aquaculture, how it might be applied to marine spatial planning, but also ocean, open observation, um, uh, ocean best practices, uh, and open data facilitation 
for the aquaculture sector. Uh, and then that includes the provision of data that the aquaculture industry has that can be fed back into data sharing tools. We sit on the advisory boards of a number of European partnerships and other projects, um, including uh, biotech areas like the Blue Bio Co-Fund. And we're specifically involved in certain projects like Aqua Excel, which is about opening transnational research facilities, and the Olomor project that my colleague Oivind has just been talking to you about. So I began by saying between biodiversity and sustainability, science to raise awareness, awareness to guide decisions, what are the perspectives of a platform? Well, from my perspective, take the principles of a multi-stakeholder approach across stakeholders, make it research and innovation focused, uh, and look at uh, your, your core being the communication, dissemination, and exploitation of those research and innovation activities. If you apply that to policy development, to research prioritization, to stakeholder engagement, and to knowledge transfer, you will lead to increased awareness and one would hope informed decision making. There are still challenges to have. I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but a couple of weeks ago in Brussels, I attended the launch of the Energy Transition Partnership, looking at energy transition targets within aquaculture and fisheries. Very interesting event format of the event, policy discussions, high-level policy statements, funding mechanisms, and then the research projects. You wonder if it shouldn't have been funding mechanisms to support research, the research projects and their outputs, and then the policy decisions that had been made as a result of those research projects and their output. But perhaps that's me being idealistic, that the policy came before the research. So there's work to make, be made, but I firmly believe that informed decision-making is born out of uh, increased awareness. Um, as a disclaimer, there are other models than technology platforms. Um, there are other technology platforms. There's one on Waterborne, which is about marine, uh, well, obviously waterborne, so uh, marine um, shipping and movement. Uh, there's Wind Europe, which looks specifically at renewable energy. There are other platforms and partnerships looking at marine spatial planning or algae or data use in other sectors. And I wouldn't claim that we're the, we're the uh, only show in town, um, even if we have better ties in our show. But um, the basic principle of multi-stakeholder collaboration remains true, vital, essential for good decision making. And on that, thank you very much for the opportunity to say that. Thank you, Thank you very much. And on this, your last message, that is a multi-stakeholders collaboration, it's quite important at European level, but it's also important at national level, where, again, you have many stakeholders. And so I would like to pass the stage to uh, Massimo Clemente. There you are. We see you. <laughs> OK. That is going to present okay. us a platform that is uh, rightly doing uh, I mean, this uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, engagement at uh, national level. So Massimo, thank you very much for waiting for, for us because we went a bit late. It's really my duty, my, my fault, because I, I took the break longer than uh, it was supposed to do that. But now we close in a very good manner with your presentation. So the floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It was very interesting to listen to all uh, the contributions. Uh, and uh, I will speak uh, quickly, of course, because uh, it's, it's late. And so I will um, um, inform you about uh, our uh, organization, that is the National Observatory for Sea Production uh, uh, in Italy, uh, the ONTM. And uh, our organization is a third sector organization whose mission is to enhance the sea resource as a strategic asset of the economic and social fabric of Italy. And uh, uh, um, the, the aim... Massimo, just a second. If you're sharing a presentation, you need to share it, because we only see you. I, I, I don't have a presentation. I can show if you are not able to listen well uh, in the paper. Uh, so you can uh, read. Yeah. I didn't get, sorry, Massimo. Are can you sharing you... a presentation or you won't just go yourself? No, just go oh, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, 
Perfect. So go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. We yeah, had no time to, to arrange a presentation. Just uh, uh, they told me just uh, two days ago that I'm going to present. So and um, so I, I just give you some information about the organization and uh, about uh, some matters that we are uh, face uh, in Italy. So um, uh, first, uh, some general uh, um, consideration uh, about our activities, about uh, our objectives. Uh, uh, and uh, about our strategy. Uh, the strategy is to involve uh, uh, the country's best resources. Uh, and so to uh, involve uh, all uh, on a voluntary basis uh, to achieve this mission uh, that is useful uh, both to, to us, uh, and of course, for next generation, uh, providing their own contribution uh, to the implementation of the observatory uh, activities and projects. Uh, and uh, among the various uh, activities, uh, the most relevant uh, is uh, that carried out in the field of innovation and technology. And uh, th this is uh, uh, according with the, uh, our organization. I will uh, tell you some um, things about this organization, specifically research in the field of technology and technological innovation that is aimed uh, to identify, to implement and develop uh, new solutions and models uh, for achieving a sustainable balance between uh, society's development needs and environmental protection with particular reference to the marine ecosystem and technological research uh, on the one end, but also great attention to the main social issues and social economic challenges that society faces every day. And uh, in fact, special attention is also, and above all, paid to the activity of environment diplomacy. I think this is very important for us, this point, the environmental diplomacy, which is translated in the search for a promotion of a balance between the instances coming from the main stakeholders the environmental and in particular many ecosystem, the economic world and the community. And these activities is favored by the observatory widespread presence uh, in almost all Italian regions with delegates uh, overseen by the regional coordinators, which are part of the uh, uh, of our executive committee. And we also promote environmental diplomacy towards the entire the entire Mediterranean basin in uh, towards the European and non-European countries that uh, look on, on the Mediterranean seas, uh, are experiencing uh, the sea as a unitary cultural vehicle around which different cultures have the opportunity to build healthy and lasting international relations in favor of the environment in general and of their respective national interests. So, about the organization, we have this innovation hub uh, that uh, has the objective to provide a concrete contribution to innovation process in the environmental sector, and in particular to the tech system that works around it. I can share just this uh, to show where we are. Uh, again, this is, uh, can, can you see the, yes, you can. Uh, and so this is our, and uh, I want to show so our vision. Um, this, uh, and in particular, that we have this. Uh, this uh, is important that uh, we have uh, uh, the ambassadors that can uh, spread our uh, activities, objectives. Uh, uh, they are uh, they have uh, a particular commitment to involve uh, stakeholders, associations, uh, and communities uh, to to join uh, all of them uh, in uh, in uh, to to face the challenges. And um, also with the delegates, in particular, we have the this executive committee with the delegates, and uh, I have the delegate. Uh, I am delegate for research and innovation. And um, uh, uh, to achieve the, its mission, uh, the INMT can rely on a network of people which prove and experience expertise in their field. And so we have the delegates, the professionals, managers, researchers, entrepreneurs appointed by the INTM board of directors 
to uh, carry out specific activities uh, or to take uh, uh, care of specific uh, projects. And uh, uh, so, as I, say, I said, I am honored to contribute to the activities uh, as research and innovation delegate. I will just uh, to, to conclude, just share with you um, this, uh, uh, this uh, point that we um, I, I, I want to uh, stress uh, uh, that are uh, um, some uh, criticalities that we found and we focused on uh, in the Mediterranean, but I think that uh, they can be considered also for all the ocean, for the marine ecosystem. And uh, in particular, uh, first uh, is the collection of marine data and in particular to their sampling and analysis in Italy, uh, we have uh, a very excessive uh, bureaucracy, well above the European standards, uh, linked to the authorization processes, which led to their substantial impracticability or uselessness, uh, since often the data, even if acquired, are obsolete uh, with respect to the objectives that had required to their collection. And our point is the lack of policies uh, facilitating the collection of up-to-date data and their publication. Uh, then the absence of a unified awareness raising policy at national level, the lack of policy to, uh, to incentivize private operators, uh, and uh, uh, just to finish, uh, uh, some possible solutions uh, and on uh, which we are working. Uh, expanding the network for monitoring marine conditions through the use of innovative technologies and systems, expanding and activating fluid wave monitoring and forecasting systems uh, on water causes, uh, promoting research activities and the consequence realization and application of innovative uh, technologies, uh, promoting cultural biodiversity and preservation of the, of the marine ecosystems, with campaigns at all levels, and not only the territories uh, washed by the sea, but also in the more inland areas of, the, of our country, which are in any case responsible for land management. Using models and best practices uh, from the uh, EU project to expand knowledge on specific issues, uh, such as, for example, the impact of marine protect areas uh, on local marine ecosystems, uh, and uh, uh, using models and best practices derived from a specific project on aquaculture. In particular, we are working with uh, referring to three pilots, uh, pilot sites in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, promoting the implementation and the optimization uh, of integrated information system useful for the management of complex data collector from different sources. And using Earth observation uh, as a radar, hyperspectral, and so on, monitoring polluting phenomena in the coastal area, detecting solid polluting elements, uh, and implementing active policies for the use of new system products usable to contain and remedy polluting phenomena in industrial and commercial port areas. Uh, I, I want just to finish, um, stress, uh, I want to stress the importance of community activity. I, I, uh, in order to uh, act with a real impact uh, on the marine ecosystem and on, uh, on the uh, sea band on the shore of the sea, that is uh, very important. Very Asimo, important. we are losing you. So okay. also in the interest of time, I, I can't ask you just to get to the conclusion. Okay, I, I am at the conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Hope you are interested about the activity of the our uh, observatory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So there could be thousands and thousands of words commending all the presentation that we had today, but I mean, time is flying, so it's good that we stop now. So one last word is about, I mean, we touched it several times. This morning we had a presentation, the greetings from the Ministry of the Sea in Italy, that was very nice. It was a very encouraging and promising message because for the first time in Italy we have a minister that is speaking about the sea. The sea is a word in the ministry. That is a quite important thing. And this is somehow 
a sort of result of uh, the multi-stakeholder collaboration discussion that we are, I mean, we, we discussed it and we are encouraging so much. So I think there is a very promising future. And with this, uh, I mean, very, uh, I mean, optimistic hope uh, with, uh, I mean, I would like to thank all the speakers of the day because all the presentation were very, very nice and I keep learning. I always say, I'm a data scientist. I know very little, but I'm working with a lot of um, wonderful people and I keep learning on a daily basis. So I want to thank you all for coming and for uh, I mean, sharing the presentation. And I invite you to have a final drink all together and chat. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>